Good morning. If you want to grab that uh, last cup of coffee, come on in. We're ready to get started. Glad to see uh, all of you here this morning. Um, that last night must have gone well. You're, you're up early and here ready um, to begin the day. It's my privilege to be able to introduce for, uh, to you uh, Dr. Jim Mercy. Uh, Jim is um, currently the uh, director of the Division of Violence Prevention at CDC. He also holds appointments uh, as an adjunct professor at um, Emory University and at the Public Health Institute at Georgia State University. Um, Jim has a long history at CDC. Um, some of the early, um, earlier kinds of work that he was involved in, I think he started, and maybe it wasn't, maybe he started earlier, but as a, a CDC epidemic intelligence service officer. I'm not sure exactly what that involved, but that apparently was, uh, was his start. In addition to that, he's had uh, work, uh, he oversaw the global activities in the division, um, worked on the Together for Girls project, which is a UN project working with respect uh, on problems related to uh, AIDS, um, and um, he was implementing um, surveys um, with respect to the levels of violence against children in uh, developing countries. Um, he he's also has been the Associate Director of Science in the division, and he served on the planning board for the Surgeon General's report on youth violence in 2001, and uh, I was the um, science editor for that um, for that project, so that was a point at which uh, we had some initial contact uh, back in 2001. Um, Jim's major contribution in many respects is the role that he played in bringing about the recognition that violence is a public health problem. Uh, those of us who have, who have bought into that idea and really appreciate the significance of that and what additional resources that really brings to the problem of violence prevention, uh, owe Jim a debt uh, to the work that he has done uh, bringing about that recognition within CDC and more generally within the public health uh, service. Um, Jim has a huge um, uh, list of publications, over 200 publications, addressing multiple forms of violence, looking at uh, child abuse, uh, youth violence, intimate partner violence, homicide, suicide, firearm violence, although we don't mention that anymore at this point. Uh, he's been the co-editor for Who's World Report on Violence and Health. He served on the editorial board of the UN Secretary General Study on Violence Against Children. He's received a number of honors, in particular um, honors from CDC and the Public Health Service and Research America for his role in uh, bringing about the recognition of violence as a public health problem. So Jim has been a supporter of Blueprints for a long time, um, and he's played a critical role, I think, in the way we think about violence and the way that we are doing research and interventions today in the area of violence. So it's a great privilege to, uh, to have uh, Jim speak to us here at the, at the Blueprints meeting. Um, Join me in welcoming uh, Jim Mercy. Thanks for that kind introduction, Dell. Um, you know, I, I want to begin by just uh, um, congratulating Dell and Sharon as they uh, rapidly approach retirement, although some people question, Dell, whether you are actually going to retire. Um, what a legacy, though, to your career's Blueprints is. Um, I, I have no doubt that Blueprints has helped to accelerate progress towards uh, evidence-based programs and practices. You know, at CDC, we, I, I, uh, we have often, over the years, looked to Blueprints for 
guidance on how to weigh evidence and assess evidence in the work that we do. And, I, and, and, and our staff, I would bet, access, one of our staff accesses blueprints weekly or perhaps daily, um, uh, uh, routinely. Um, it's also helped us to begin to, to bridge uh, evidence with implementation. And now you're also looking at how to bridge uh, or look about evidence around policy. So just to say congratulations and thank you for your work on this. It's been a tremendous legacy. And if we could just give them a round of applause. I think. Um, well, I want to try to, I have two objectives with this talk. The first is to try to, I realize I'm preaching to the converted, but the first is to try to imbue you with a greater sense of urgency for addressing violence, even then, than you may have already. And the second is to, um, as I do this, to try to give you a sense of where CDC, the Division of Violence Prevention, is headed in this area. There's going to be a lot of parallels between the kinds of things I talk about and and Jeff Jensen talked about yesterday. But I want to sort of introduce you in, as I talk about this, to a public health perspective on this problem. Um, many, see, many of you are probably aware of this already. So first I want to start, give you sort of two perspectives on this issue. And the first, I want you just to sit back and relax and imagine something for a second. Imagine that you got up this morning, you picked up the newspaper, or you went online to look at the news or on TV, and the major headline was that scientists had discovered a new disease. And you go on to read the article, and it says that scientists had discovered that each year, more than half the world's children, over a billion children, were exposed to this disease each year. And that those children exposed to this disease we're at greater risk for mental health problems during their lifetimes. We're at greater risk for acquiring HIV and other sexually transmitted diseases during their lifetimes. We're at greater risk for even chronic diseases, such as diabetes, heart disease, and cancer during their lifetimes. We're at greater risk to perform poorly in school, to not graduate from high school, to be unemployed as an adult. What if we had such a disease? Well, the truth is, we do have such a disease. It's called violence against children and youth. And I'm, I don't tell you this or, or, or share that sort of perspective to convince you that violence is a disease. That's not my point. My point is to emphasize that when we consider violence in this way, we consider it from a public health perspective, it gives us greater urgency. It gives us a greater sense of why it is important for us to address it. The second uh, perspective I want to sort of share with you that's, that's shaped uh, my perspective on violence is the way public health addresses problems. You all, of course, are familiar with the epidemics of Ebola and a little more recently Zika that, um, that we faced globally and in part in the U.S. Um, if you look at the response to these diseases, it was incredible. Let's, let me talk about Ebola. CDC, soon after Ebola broke out and started to spread, uh, instituted a 24-7 response to this problem. Congress initiated a $1.8 billion emergency appropriation to CDC to address it. 30%, they requisitioned staff across the agency to be engaged in it. 30% of the staff of the Division of Violence Prevention were taken away to work in Ebola. One of our staff members, a young woman was shipped over to Sierra Leone, dropped off in a rural area of Sierra Leone, and she was told, you need to figure out how to, dis how to clean up or disinfect the households where somebody has died of Ebola in this rural region of Sierra Leone. Um, she figured it out. She worked with the local folks. She worked with other uh, UN agencies and, and other people, uh, NGOs, working on the problem. But here's the thing, one thing, uh, if you look at Ebola and you look at violence, the impact of, a, of violence dwarfs the impact of Ebola almost every credible measure you can think of. 
Now, of course, Ebola is an incredibly scary disease that's highly infectious. But aside from that, the impact of violence around the world in the United States far, far by far eclipses the impact of Ebola. But Ebola was viewed as urgent. Violence is not yet viewed as an urgent problem, an urgent public health problem. The other thing about it is nobody, even though CDC and other experts didn't really know how to respond to Ebola, they'd never had a disease of this nature to contend with, nobody raised their hand and said we shouldn't address Ebola until we have perfect scientific knowledge. We took, we recognized it as an urgent problem, mounted a, 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 a response to it, used science and evidence to, to uh, direct that response. And, and you should be very proud of what your government and CDC did to stem that epidemic. It was pretty remarkable. But my point is that we also have uh, a lot of evidence to draw on, and we also need to respond to violence as an urgent problem. So one thing that you'll see in the work we do at CDC more and more is our focus on children and youth. These are data from the National Crime Victimization Survey, and you can see that uh, the rates of violent victimization, overall violent victimization, decline with age with the greatest rates or prevalence among 12 to 17-year-olds. Um, you can also see that serious violent crime, those that result in injury or involve the use of a weapon, are, remain higher through young adulthood. But I think this and other evidence would suggest that, that children and youth in particular have a disproportionate, suffer from violence disproportionately as both victims, and of course are involved disproportionately as, as perpetrators. These are data from National Crime Victimization Sur Survey also, and here they're comparing youth with adults overall, and you can see that even when you look at serious violence, youth 12 to 17 are more likely than adults as a whole to experience violence in which a weapon is used or an injury occurs. And here's some data from the National Intimate Partner and Sexual Violence Survey. This is a survey that CDC does, but it's really impactful, I think. What it shows is that the proportion of women who experienced in the upper bar rape at, of, of women who experience rape, over 80% first experience rape when they're less than 25 years old. 40% first experience rape when they're less, when they were children, less than 18 years old. Similarly, for intimate partner violence, about 70% first experience intimate partner violence when they're less than 25, and about 23% when they were children. So I think there's no question, and we all recognize the disproportionate involvement that children and youth have in violence. And this is one of the reasons why we think it's an important focus. Another thing I want to share with you is this idea of something that's endemic as opposed to epidemic. We tend to focus in our society on things that are epidemic, Ebola being the perfect example. But I think there's abundant evidence that violence is endemic in the US and around the world. Endemic meaning a disease or condition that's regularly found, that's very common in a particular group or area. Common cold is endemic. When we looked and tried to estimate the number of children exposed in one year to violence in the world, looking at surveys across the world, we found that over a billion children were exposed to some form of violence each year. That's about half the world's children. And you can see the numbers here. They're, they're absolutely incredible. And this was a minimum estimate. For many reasons, we, could, we, we tried to be conservative in the way we were estimating this, the levels of violence that children are exposed to. We look at homicide in the United States, which is, of course, the tip of the iceberg. 
But in 2016, about 11,000 children, adolescents, and young adults were exposed to homicide. That's about 30 children and youth every day. So we have about the equivalent of almost two Parkland-sized mass shootings every day in the United States. Of course, all these deaths are not associated in time and place like Parkland was. But imagine two Parkland shootings, mass shootings every day occur in the United States. We pay attention to the epidemic, the sort of mini epidemic in Parkland. We pay very little attention to the endemic aspects of this problem. Homicide is the third leading cause of death among persons one to 34 years of age in the US. It's the leading cause of death for African Americans under age 35 years of age. It's been that way for decades. Not HIV, not cancer, not infectious disease, not all the things we think of as public health problems, but homicide. If black lives truly matter, we can't let this stand. Here's data from the National Childhood Exposure to Violence Survey that David Finkelhor does, who many of you I'm sure know. But again, again, past year exposure to child maltreatment, assault, sexual victimization, witnessing violence. There's somewhere between 70 and 80 million children in the United States, and somewhere between 40 to 50% of those children have experienced some sort of violence during the past year. Again, I make the point, it's endemic. We do have epidemics of violence, many epidemics, but underlying that is an endemic problem. Endemic problems are hard to change. We become used to them. We sort of accept them. But this is something we, we, we can't accept. Another thing we're trying to do is make visible the costs of inaction on violence. And I think the costs are enormous. Um, there are literally hundreds of studies documenting the associations that I'm going to talk to you about here. This evidence is stronger for some of them than others, but the evidence is pretty, pretty strong and pretty convincing. We know that, and this is looking at violence as a risk factor instead of an outcome, right? Violence is a risk factor for, the, for other outcomes, particularly health outcomes. Of course, we know that violence is associated with injury. But it's also a major risk factor for mental health problems. Serious ones, depression and anxiety disorders, for example. It's also a risk factor for different types of maternal and child health problems, including pregnancy and complications associated with pregnancy. It's also a risk factor for risk behaviors, such as alcohol and drug use, smoking, unsafe sexual behaviors. Also, and the evidence is getting stronger, a risk factor for disease outcomes, as I said, including diabetes, cancer, heart disease, HIV. And we're ha we have recent evidence showing that it's associated with not graduating from high school, unemployment in adulthood, and household poverty. One of the studies and that I want to share with you is the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. Many of you are familiar with this. CDC, in conjunction with the, um, Kaiser Permanente in San Diego, did this study during the 1990s. And what they did was they measured interviewing adults in the a Kaiser Permanente HMO in San Diego and asked them questions about their childhood experiences. And on the left-hand slide of the slide, you see the typical types of violence and other adversities that are measured in these surveys. Primarily child abuse and neglect, and then household cha challenges, which include exposure to intimate partner violence or witnessing intimate partner violence. Um, and what, the, what they do in these studies typically is they create an ACE measure in which they create the measure based on the number of different exposure, these different types of adversity and violence. So if you're exposed to physical and emotional abuse and neglect or, and physical abuse, you get a score of two. If you're exposed to physical abuse and, and incar you had an incarcerated parent and, and sub a parent who, did, who was engaged in substance abuse, you get a three and so on. And then they associate this with various health outcomes. 
Now, I want to point out that this ACE measure and the way we define ACEs does not include many types of adversity and violence that children typically experience, bullying, teen dating violence, assault, witnessing violence in the community or school, death of a parent. There's many other adversities, but what I look at this as, as is an indicator of chaos and stress in a child or, or, youth or adolescent's life. But the results of this survey, and it's been applied in, in many, uh, this study and many other contexts, are pretty amazing. Now remember the ACE score. What you find is that the risk of ever injecting drugs increases during your lifetime, increases with the greater number of adverse childhood experiences you experience as a child. So you can see there's a stepwise increasing risk associated with increasing exposure to adversity as a child. You can also see that the number of sex partners increases. These are all risk factors for HIV. And however, having a sexually transmitted diseases increases in the same stepwise pattern. Here's with adult cardiovascular disease. You see the same stepwise pattern with increased risk of cardiovascular disease as an adult associated with increased exposure to adversity as a child. There's two causes of death that are increasing in the United States right now, opioid overdose and suicide. Some people refer to these as deaths of despair. And you can see here the association between exposure to ACEs and suicide attempts, both in adolescence and adulthood, and you see the same stepwise pattern. Here's what I also showed you earlier, the same stepwise pattern with regard to IV, IV drug use. And here's those data. These are not from the Kaiser Permanente CDC study in San Diego. These are from the behavioral risk factor surveillance system that CDC runs. Some states used an ACE module in their surveys and, um, and we looked at the association of exposure to ACEs to these different life opportunities. Not quite always as nice a pattern as you see for other health outcomes, but still the same sort of pattern of increased likelihood of, of not graduating high school, of unemployment and household poverty status with increased exposure to ACEs. Here's another type of study that talks about, and let me say about those health outcomes. They're hidden from view, right? Some adult that has cardiovascular disease is not necessarily thinking that the disease is associated with what they experienced as a child. Their physician is probably not associating the two either. We don't see the we don't, while we can see it on a population basis, we don't recognize the association between exposure to violence and adversity as a child with these health outcomes as adults. We have to make these types of associations visible. Here's a study we did a few years ago estimating the cost of child maltreatment in the United States. And one of the things we did as part of this study was estimate the reduction in income that the person experienced child maltreatment would have as an adult. And you can see that we estimated that, that adults experiencing child maltreatment would earn almost $6,000 less on average than adults who had not experienced child maltreatment. And we compared it to similar estimates for obesity, teen pregnancy, and smoking. It turned out that the loss in future productivity of child maltreatment was, was more than each of those losses added together. Not to minimize the importance of obesity, smoking, and teen pregnancy, but to, but to emphasize the cost, the hidden cost, of exposure to violence as a child. I also want you to understand some people say or make the point that perhaps these associations between violence and all these different outcomes are trivial. Maybe it's a small association and cumulatively they're important, but individually they may be, may be small. Well, what we're finding in various ways is they're not that small. This is a study that Ron Kessler, one of a preeminent behavioral epidemiologist in the world, did using the World Mental Health Survey in 21 countries. And they measured childhood adversity. And they found, of course, that it was associated with all classes of mental health, regardless of the type of country. 
and also with suicidal behavior. But what I want you to focus on is they also estimated what's called the preventable fraction of mental health problems in adulthood that are attributable to exposure to, to this childhood adversity as a child and estimated that 30% of adult psychopathology was attributable to exposure to adversity as a child. Said another way that if we could magically eradicate violence against children and other adversities, we could potentially reduce mental health problems by 30%. Here's another similar type study um, where they tried to estimate the fraction of these health or risk behaviors attributable to exposure to childhood violence and adversity in the UK. And what you see here is based on their estimates, and this was based on longitudinal data, understanding of the association between childhood adversity and these health outcomes, and understanding the prevalence of these different health outcomes in the population, that exposure to childhood violence and adversity accounted for almost 60% of heroin and crack use in the UK, a little over 30% of teen pregnancy, maybe around 15% of smoking. So these are crude estimates, and they need to be refined. But my point is that the association between exposure to violence as a child and, a, and youth and these range of risk behaviors and health outcomes is not trivial. So why do we find these associations? Now, I'm a sociologist, so I, I checked the roster, and there's no neuroscientists in, the office, in, the, in, in this. But you've got to be careful when sociologists talk about brain science. But let me give you my explanation. One of the mechanisms, and I think, that we're understanding is that the exposure to this, to adversity, it creates toxic stress, which evokes responses in our brain the flight or fright syndrome that release chemicals that when released often enough can actually change brain architecture, particularly in children, youth, or in critical periods of brain development. The release of these chemicals on a routine basis can actually change the brain structure in important ways. It can inhibit the formation of healthy neural circuitry. It can change, it can affect the immune system, the endocrine system, the stress regulation system that our brain oversees. And because of these changes, it changes our, our health outlook. Let me give you a very brief pathway that this could occur. One of, the way, one of the things that this can affect is the stress regulation system, so that people exposed to trauma as a child, actually, when they experience trauma as an adult, they, can actually, they evoke a stress response very quickly, oftentimes. So how might you deal with, if you're an adult or even an adolescent, and your stress regulation sort of kicks in under moderate or slight provocation? Well, you might self-medicate. You might smoke. You might overeat. You might abuse substances, alcohol, drugs, all of things of which are risk factors for health outcomes. But it's, the science is even going beyond that. We're understanding now, this is the realm of epigenetics, that actually this exposure, these environmental exposures can change our DNA, change it in ways that can affect our, um, our health, premature aging. But not only that, potentially be passed on to the next generation. So violence exposure as a child or youth gets under the skin in profound ways that affects our health. Let me show you this slide, which was really helps to emphasize the importance of primary prevention. What the neuroscientists tell us is that our brain, our brain is more vulnerable, or what they call is more plastic, more vulnerable to environmental influence and experience the younger we are. And that vulnerability decreases with age. But the cost of trying to remediate impacts on the brain, trying to recreate healthy neural circuitry, or change changes in the structural impacts of the brain on, a, on the immune system, gets costs more over time. Because of that, it's so important 
that we get it right the first time, that we prevent exposure to this. Economists tell us that the, the, the cost of not catching it earlier is much greater to remediate it than to try to get it right the first time. Hence the importance of all the work that you do. One of the things that, and you'll see us everywhere we go emphasize these connections between exposure to violence and health. What it means is that violence prevention is strategic, particularly violence prevention in, in children and youth. From a policymaker's standpoint, there are a few issues, but if you can address them effectively, you can affect a whole range of health and social outcomes. So from a policymaker's standpoint, prevention of violence against children and youth is strategic. Another thing we're trying to do is break down the silos by acting on the cross-cutting nature of violence. These different types of violence that children and youth experience are all associated. They share common risk and protective factors. Perpetrators often perpetrate multiple forms. Victims often suffer multiple forms. Child maltreatment is a risk factor for other types of violence later in life. They're connected in so many ways. And yet, and they also have their own unique characteristics. Please don't misunderstand me. But we don't take advantage of the fact that they share common risk and protective factors. We don't use that enough. Our funding that we get at CDC and Division of Violence Prevention is siloed. We get money for child maltreatment. We get money for intimate partner violence. We get money for youth violence. But they're separated. Yet, what we're learning and what we understand is that we can become much more efficient in preventing violence. And this was a, a point that Jeff Jensen made yesterday in his keynote presentation from a different angle, from the standpoint of interventions. We can be much more efficient by recognizing the cross-cutting nature of violence and acting on the common risk factors and protective factors that cross-cut these types of violence. Many of the interventions that you do are not just going to impact the primary outcome of interest you have, perhaps impact multiple forms of violence. And I would say also other um, health outcomes for, for youth and, and adolescents as well, substance abuse, teen pregnancy, for example. So I think while I think this has been well known in the, in, the, in the scientific literature for many years, I think we need to translate this into, into um, more tangible action. We be, can become much more efficient in trying to prevent violence. One of the ways that we're doing this is in the, the, the studies that we fund to evaluate different types of violence prevention programs and policies to ask the researchers to measure a series of outcomes, not just the one that they're focused on primarily for their intervention, but to see if that intervention has multiple impacts across different types of violence. This is just a, a chart, an example to show you from a, from a report from CDC called Connecting the Dots, where they looked at, and, and on the top line from uh, left to right is child maltreatment, teen dating violence, intimate partner violence, sexual violence, youth violence, and so on. And the X's in the boxes represent where they identified literature which documented that the risk factor on the left was associated with that particular form of violence. And you can see in this matrix, most of the boxes have an X in them. Most of the boxes show that we already have evidence linking that particular risk factor to a variety of violence outcomes. So again, I think it's important that we figure out ways to use the interventions we have more efficiently so that we can impact multiple forms of violence. I said at the beginning about the preventability of violence and the need to take action now because it is an urgent problem. One of the things that we've been doing the past few years is to develop what we call technical packages. I hate the term technical packages, but it was a term that a former director of CDC liked. But these, let me say what they're not first. These are not registries. These are not systematic reviews. These are not implementation guidance. But what they are is collections of the best available evidence so that communities, policymakers, state and local health departments, our main constituency can understand that we have a lot of evidence for how to address violence. Um, it's, 
it is a myth that I fight every day that we do not know how to prevent violence. And I imagine you all often face the same barrier. Um, but uh, these are an attempt to articulate a strategy and the rationale for addressing different types of violence. And if you look at CDC technical packages violence, you'll find the website where you can access these. But they really help people, communities, articulate a strategy or a set of strategies that they can use to take on these problems. Here, what I did here is I just drew on the different strategies from across these packages that related to children and youth. And to use sort of blueprints terminology, the things in the boxes at the bottom are sort of practices, right? These, these let me say something else about these packages. We only provided examples of interventions, programs that reflected these different strategies. We did not include all of the literature and all of the, the different interventions that are associated with these different practices in the boxes. So your program may not be in this package, but it was not our intent to make this a systematic review. But rather what we hope to do is illustrate that we have an abundance of evidence. Now, let me say, this is the best available evidence. You take the four boxes to the right, strong start, teach skills, engaging influence adults and peers, and lessening harms. Those are the areas where we have the most evidence, very solid evidence about things that we can do to prevent violence against children. The, uh, the, the strategies on the left, strengthening economic support, promoting positive social norms and creating protective environments, we need much better evidence. But we still included them because we believe that we should also be making use of these strategies to address the outer levels of the socioecology. And there is, although not as strong as evidence for the boxes, the strategies on the right, there is evidence to support these different types of strategies on the left. Another point I wanted to make is this is something called the Health Impact Pyramid. A former director of CDC, Tom Frieden, used this. And he, he used it to try to make a point. And the point is, and if you look at this pyramid, at the top of the pyramid are those types of interventions uh, that address primarily, um, that are, for example, behavior change interventions that try to change the uh, school curricula, uh, clinical type interventions. As you move towards the bottom of the pyramid, include the interventions that try to change social norms in, in communities or society. There, it, it gets more into the policy realm. It's sort of moving from programmatic to a policy realm. And his point was to say, not that the, the interventions at the top of the pyramid are not important, they are critically important, but to scale them up to have population impact, which is what we try to do at CDC and in public health, to have true population impact in terms of reducing, in this case, rates of violence or the prevalence of violence. That these efforts at the top take, take an incredible amount of individual effort to scale up and get implemented in as broad a way to make population impact. The types of interventions at the bottom um, can more easily have population impact although they face other impediments. Things at the bottom would include like things like fluoride in the water for dental health, right? You, don't have, you, you are benefited by, the, by fluoride in the water if you just drink water or brush your teeth. Um, you don't have to take action to do that. Uh, airbags in cars, policies that require that in cars, of course, make the choice, we don't have to make a choice to be protected by that intervention. Efforts to change social norms, for example, maybe around child discipline, are another example of things that would fit at the bottom of this pyramid. Now, of course, the bigger challenge for this type of public policies are political challenges. At the bottom of this period would be included firearm injury prevention policies. and. Uh, don't need to say much to talk about the political challenges of those types of interventions. But the point is, from my standpoint, is that we need both. We need both 
the types of interventions that are at the bottom of this, at the top of this pyramid, and the types of interventions, the policy, the social interventions at the bottom of this pyramid. You'll see a lot of our announcements and funding uh, on f calls for proposals to try to strengthen the evidence base at the bottom of this, of this pyramid. And one reason why I'm so um, thrilled that the blueprints is now going to be taking on, on the issue of how do you assess evidence around policy interventions. So another big focus of ours, and which we're trying to move to as quickly as we can, is the need to create greater capacity and infrastructure to scale up violence prevention. And I know many of you in the room are familiar with this, this type of work and the thinking around this, but um, it, you know, I used to think when I was younger, if we could just show people that we can prevent violence, everybody will jump on board, right? Um, well, obviously it's not enough. We also have to demonstrate how we can take the evidence, the science we know, and apply it and, and scale it up to make true population impact. We have to create a workforce Many of you are, are in this workforce already. We're working, for example, with the uh, Air Force to, to create a workforce of violence prevention interventionists across the Air Force and its bases. It's a tremendous challenge um, to think about how to educate them and integrate them into the Air Force in order to make a difference in that structure, in that culture. But creating a workforce that can actually understand violence prevention and apply it in the systems which they work on is critically important. Synthesis and translation of science, obviously important, something that Blueprints does well. Prevention support, we, Jeff Jensen talked yesterday about the sort of intermediary organizations like the Epicenter in Pennsylvania that provide support to communities who want to implement evidence-based um, programs and practices. And also, how do, you, how do you support those organizations to stay alive, to sustain themselves, to deliver this important work? Critically important, something that we're investing more and more in. I got these slides from, a, many of you may know, have known Mark Chafin. He's a brilliant scientist and, and communicator. And he passed away a couple years ago. But, but uh, I love these slides. And they'll, they'll be familiar to you in different ways. But, how many have seen the movie Field of Dreams? A great, great movie, right? And, um, and you remember the, the, the main calling line of that movie, build it, the, you know, the guys were calling from the, the cornfield, build it and they will come. That was, that's the dream, right? But in implementation, that's not, that's not always the reality. If you build it, they may not know. I, I was, uh, a few years ago at the end of the Obama administration, I was in a meeting with, talking about youth violence prevention, with um, the person who was the lead on youth and adolescence on President Obama's domestic policy council. And the conversations, it came, became apparent that he had no idea that we knew anything about how to prevent youth violence. Um, we have to do a better job of communicating what we know about the science of violence and prevention to people in policy-making positions. I'm not sure I know how to do that, but I know it's critically important. And people don't know. They simply, by and large, do not know about the incredible work you do and the incredible science that underlies it. And I know you've experienced this one. If you build it, they may like the one they built better even if it doesn't work, right? <laughs> I'm not sure how to overcome, you may be, be able to educate me on how to overcome that one. If you build it, they will try to come, but the map you sent wasn't written in their language. This is the issue about adapting to culture and language, and, and we have to do this while we maintain fidelity to the components of the interventions that really drive the change that we seek to make. But, it is very important to recognize and adapt to the cultures and the communities in which we're implementing the evidence, of course. And finally, if you build it, they may want to come but can't afford admission. This is something 
I think is important. How can we reduce the cost of violence prevention? You know, one way, as I alluded to earlier, is to try to take advantage of interventions that have impact on multiple outcomes. I think it's really important to demonstrate that because in that way we bec could become more efficient in the way we prevent violence. So another thing we're doing is trying to reduce the gap between science or data and action. Communities that care is a great example of this, where you try to integrate data directly into the effort that a community takes to try to think about what to do to implement it and to evaluate whether they're making a difference. To try to make that all part of one process and, sh and, 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 and reduce the gap between data and action. There's many other examples, too, that we're exploring are trying to use and explore social media data. Now, with what's happening with Facebook, this may become more difficult. But um, these data are often available in real time, and um, they offer tremendous opportunities for, for understanding the problems we face better and to intervene with, on those problems in different ways. So I think that's a, that's a real new frontier about reducing this gap between data and action. Another is different methodologies that are emerging. Um, the idea of using predictive analytics in medicine, precision medicine, is becoming very popular where using data to tailor interventions to specific types of uh, individuals, like for cancer, the intervention that works for one individual may not work for another. And an example of this is we did a study in Wilmington, Delaware, if you can believe it, Delaware, the state of Delaware had the highest increase in homicide rates over the past 15 years in the United States of any other state. And most of that increase was concentrated in Wilmington. So we were invited in. This is something that epidemic intelligence service officers do. They're the disease detectives. They go into a community and help solve problems, public health problems. So our EIS officer went in and took you to, Delaware is incredible, and they have all these administrative databases that track the, the residents of that state, participation in social services, in emergency departments, and, and health and hospital data, in education system, um, in law enforcement. He was able to link those data together, use a predictive analytics methodology to predict with a high degree of accuracy who was likely to engage in um, gun violence in the next uh, year. So the, the, the hope is, and there's many questions about this, we have to refine things and learn much more, and there's ethical questions about doing this type of work as well, but the hope is that you could use predictive analytics in certain situations to identify who is in need of the types of services that you all offer before they become a perpetrator of gun violence. So, these types of methodologies open often new avenues for reducing this gap between data and action, something that is, is characterizing our work in violence prevention more and more. Something that's important to me before I became director of the Division of Violence Prevention, I work globally on violence prevention, and um, I think it's very important that we don't silo ourselves across the world as well, because we're all learning so much about this issue. Something that happened recently is the creation of the Sustainable Development Goals. These were the follow-on to what's called the Millennium Development Goals. But these targets were included for the, th these are goals that are, that are developed by countries around the world through the UN. And for the first time in 2015, goals and targets around violence prevention were included in the Sustainable Development Goals. And you can see they're aspirational in nature. For example, they call for ending abuse, exploitation, and trafficking, all forms of violence against and torture of children. But what's really significant about this is for the first time, the world came together and established a target for reducing, for preventing different types of violence. Any, I would say that any major accomplishment in the world started with somebody in some way establishing a goal, calling for an objective to accomplish something. 
So to me, these are, are very significant. They will attract um, investment by social development agencies across the world. They have already galvanized the creation of new partnerships. One is the Global Partnership to End Violence Against Children. They're bringing together UN agencies and other. So these have all sorts of significance from my perspective. And they also call for all countries, including the United States, to try to achieve these goals, these targets in particular. So to me, that carries great significance. Um, Dell had mentioned the work we were doing on violence against children surveys. And right now, we're, we're, we've completed surveys in about 14 or 15 countries and, and have a handful of others where we're currently conducting surveys or planning them and have repeated the survey in two countries. This effort is not just a survey. It's sort of like communities that care and it integrates data with action. But one thing I want to tell you, you can see that most of these surveys are concentrated in sub-Saharan Africa. Where we got the money to do these surveys is from PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, because they recognize, and they have made tremendous progress in reducing HIV in Africa. But the one group where HIV continues to increase is girls and young women. And they've recognized that exposure, particularly to sexual violence, but also other types of violence, is a major risk factor for HIV acquisition, particularly in this group. And so they've invested in these surveys. What we have to do is find ways to get into the pockets in violence prevention, get in the pockets, the deep pockets, the people with the deep pockets. HIV has billions of dollars. Other things like mental health maybe doesn't have billions of dollars, but other outcomes that violence is associated with offer opportunities for us to get funding to prevent violence because violence is a risk factor for those outcomes. Just to show you, these surveys have found um, this is sexual violence reported as a child in um, the first eight countries or nine countries that we did. And you can see the prevalence among uh, females and males for each of these countries um, experienced during childhood it ranges from about 40% in females in Swaziland to 4% in Cambodia. Um, it offered, it, now they raise many fascinating questions about the variation in these. Look in Haiti where um, male exposure to sexual violence during a childhood was almost as great as female exposure. But these surveys are rich with data about exposure to violence as a child and being used to guide action. We're also developed to help guide the country's action. We won't work with a country unless the government agrees that they're going to use the data to guide action in their country and take and develop plans to uh, sustain action against violence against children. This is a technical package similar to the ones I showed you earlier and it articulates very similar type of strategies that I, that I showed you that are appropriate in the United States from uh, parent and caregiver support to um, uh, response and support services and um, education and life skills, the same type of strategies. The evidence that we have for these things is much stronger in the North and developing uh, countries than it is in low and middle income countries. But low and middle income countries are doing some incredibly innovative work. And they are forced to do this work at a fraction of the cost that we do it in the United States. So we have much to learn from them. And they also can learn from us. And we, we right from the beginning, uh, try to catalyze the action by creating a task force in the country that, that, that thinks about how we can do the survey and how we can use the data to make a difference. So finally, just let me say what I think is the most important thing, and I alluded to earlier, is the need to communicate that violence prevention is strategic. As I said earlier, it's associated with all these different sorts of outcomes, sort of one-stop shopping for preventing a host of health and social problems, and very important to recognize in that strategic way. I hope I've convinced you, imbued you with a sense of the urgency of this problem. It's a big public health and social problem and criminal justice problem. It influences many different health and social outcomes. The costs are enormous. We do have viable prevention programs and policies. The data I shared with you and the data that you operate on is scientifically grounded. And I hope it's politically feasible. 
And let me leave you with this, one of my favorite quotes from Jack Shonkoff. One of the most powerful ways to change the world is to make it better for kids. And I would add that one of the most powerful ways to make it better for kids is reduce their exposure to violence. And if there's nothing else that you take from my presentation, I hope that this allows you to see deep inside yourself that the work you are doing is making the world, is changing the world and making it better for kids. Thank you so much. We have time for questions. And Well, there is a certain amount of exchange, but Congress largely decides. Um, you all advocates also help to influence that by contacting their congresspersons. Um, but by and large, Congress decides how the money is appropriated to us and how we will spend it. We have some flexibility, like, but oftentimes, Division of Violence Prevention has a $100 million annual budget. 40% of that is for a rape prevention education program. Congress stipulates that we have to spend it on that. It's a formula grant that goes out to the states. 23 to 25% is for the National Violent Death Reporting System, which is a data collection system that collects data on homicides and suicides. Um, we have to use it for that. That's what the, the legislative language, the appropriate language says. And then we get money into other different silos, but it, it oftentimes frustrating to me that I don't have more flexibility in using the data. We can try to braid data for child maltreatment and youth violence, for example. We've, we've had some announcements. We try to bring the funding together to use in a comprehensive way. But by and large, Congress determines how we will, um, how we will spend those monies and is pretty, pretty strict and restrictive about that. And our agency is very careful about not spending it in a way that's not associated with the way we were uh, asked to do it by Congress, so. Because I don't want to be in the position of later coming back and a congressperson saying, why did you not spend it in that way? There's plenty of examples of that happening in government. <laughs> that was exhausting. <laughs> so with things like the Parkland tragedy, we see it ripple through the country and national media exposure is high, it's on the news. Um, they're turning to people that um, want to communicate. How do we do a better job of more effective communication to inform through the media and the public about solutions and best practices along with educating Congress? What's a more strategic approach? I'm not a communication expert, but I'll give you my take on it. I think, I think part of the problem is we're siloed out there, right? And we need a common message. And there's so much that common we have in terms of our understanding of violence and its importance and its prevention that one of the things we want to do by breaking down those silos is bring together the community that works out there on violence prevention. Oftentimes, the advocates for child maltreatment are at odds with the advocates for intimate partner violence prevention. Um, it's becoming less so, but I think it's important that we, that we come together somehow. And Parkland, you're right, is such an incredibly important example. Nobody wants violence in schools. We need to stop these sort of mass shootings that are occurring in schools and in other contexts. But by our estimate, less than 2% of homicides occurring to children, school-aged children, occur in school environments. Kids are actually safer in schools than they often are in their communities or families. But it's hard to get that message out 
and the environment and sort of the, the media frenzy that exists in the aftermath of a shooting like Parkland. And I wish I had a better idea of how to break through that, but I think developing common messages that we can reinforce um, amongst the various advocates for violence prevention, recognizing how we all have so much in common is an important first step. Um, thank you. I really appreciated your focus on like the needs to work with children and youth. And one of my questions was, I know um, the Office of Violence Against Women gives a lot of funding to preventing violence against women and they just reallocated a little bit of their funding to focus on adult men as a little bit of a shift in their focus. Do you have any, um, I guess, input about that? And Because when that happened, I was curious of why they kind of re took some money away from engaging youth, which was a lot of their focus in past grant distributions. Could you, could you just repeat that? Because I couldn't quite hear you. They've taken money to focus so, on? Yeah, they shifted some money from their like, youth and children programming and shifted that to um, some, it's a small portion, but to focus on engaging adult men in preventing violence against women versus starting with the youth. Well, I, I don't know the rationale underlying that. I think when I say focus on children and youth, I think we do have to engage adults, for example, in that effort. But, um, and, 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 and I think that engaging men and boys in the effort to prevent intimate partner violence is critically important. But that, from everything we understand, we know that, that, that engaging them early is, is critically important to preventing intimate partner violence. For some reason, there's been this distinction between intimate partner violence is often looked at as an adult phenomenon, but it, it starts young. It starts with what you're experiencing in your household. Witnessing violence, with children witnessing violence among their parents is an incredibly important risk factor for intimate partner violence as adult. Engaging in or being a victim of teen dating violence is a precursor to that type of behavior. So I would argue, yes, we have to engage adults, we have to engage boys, but we have to engage them earlier if we're really gonna focus on prevention. Any other questions? Well, thank you so much. Really appreciate it, thanks. Thanks, Jim. I think that was that gave us, I think, a really much broader perspective. It did for me, at least, on the issues of violence um, and the the role that the work that we're doing can play, um, and the need to think more globally um, than I I think we tend to do. Um, I'd like to remind everybody uh, before you leave that we are looking for your evaluations. So would you take time uh, to fill out those evaluation forms for us? And, and there are places you can deposit them outside. Uh, it's critical for us as we think about planning uh, for the next uh, Blueprints conference that we get input uh, from you. So if you will take the time, and we've got extra time this morning that you might use that time to fill out the evaluation forms. Then we're ready to go and have our break. Uh, remember that the next uh, sessions, the morning sessions, start, uh, what, 10.15, I believe. Is that correct? Okay. Thank you very much. Have a great morning.